Good morning, everyone. It's Lee Henson, president and founder of Agile Dan. It's time for today's episode of the Daily Stand-Up. So without any further ado, let's get started. Today, I was asked to review another article, an awesome article. It was featured on scrum.org, and it was authored by Dave West. Now, this article, it looks like it was first listed back in September. And uh, the article's titled Product Owners, Stakeholders, or People. So someone asked me, to review. There are five topics he covers here, and uh, we're just going get to our, get our head around those and talk about them a little bit. So uh, he starts out saying, recently spent some time with a few product owners who work at a large financial services company, and uh, he goes on to describe uh, how he considers himself, himself a product person and loves listening to how others have solved many complex problems. I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that uh, I find that the conversations I have with product owners are usually the most heartfelt and usually the most deep, right? Uh, and he talks more about, uh, you know, the question came up, of course, uh, which is, you know, the conversation that always happens. How do you, for a lack of better term, manage your stakeholders, right? So let's start with the facts, right? The product owner is responsible for maximizing value to product created by the Scrum team, and that means they do everything to ensure the team or teams are delivering the right stuff. I couldn't agree more. I think sometimes we take that responsibility and try to spread it out across multiple people. What I'm starting to see is that a lot of organizations are attempting to do things like hybridized agile or product owner by proxy, and it's just not working, right? Uh, in order to do that effectively, you have to have clearly defined goals and you have to have a product backlog that's well-managed and well-organized, right? It needs to be in a good stack rank order. And, uh, you know, it's, it's that intersection. And I talk about this all the time. It's the intersection between the real world problems that the customer's facing, so the customer facing issues, the strategic priorities, the things that are high priority that we're trying to get done, and the technological awareness to do what's necessary in order for us to uh, keep and stay advanced with technology. But we also have restraints like budget and uh, regulatory governance, other constraints uh, that, were, that, that uh, are related to stakeholder needs. So it's important for us to try to find that balance. I remember in Henry Heinrich Nieberg's video where he put the, the three concentric circles, he did a Venn diagram and he showed build the thing right, build the right thing and build it fast and talk about the, the uh, finding that sweet spot in the middle. And I think that when you're trying to balance that many things, you know, you always tend to let one slip, right? So for me, the product owner is both a fantastic journey, but it's also the most difficult thing that they'll do. It, it really is a challenge. Uh, and I think that most product owners would agree that their, their mission is to change the world and make the world a better place uh, through building incredible products and services. But whenever anything goes wrong, everyone's always pointing the finger at you. So the question that is posed in the article, I think is a really good question, is how much time should a product owner spend uh, with stakeholders versus with the team? So you want to see what kind of, how do you do the balancing act, I guess is a better question. And uh, the answer, of course, is exactly what you expect me to say, adult undergarments. No, really. The answer is it depends. What does it depend on? It depends on the situation, right? We all know that that answer is never good enough. So I, I love that Dave breaks it down. He talks about five pieces or a few things. I think it's five. Yes, yeah, five things that he wants to share regarding that balance. So here we go. So coming in at number one, he says, be mindful of your stakeholders. That means to write down who they are and keep notes on them. Uh, it sounds odd to keep a record of them, but if you keep track of when you last talked to them, what they were thinking, especially if you're in like a large organization, it helps you keep track of what was said, when it was said, and how things happen. And that way you can uh, remind your stakeholders if necessary about conversations that you've had. And that way you're not crazy when you go back and look and say, oh, well, I'm sure they said this, or I'm sure this happened. Well, it probably did. It's just good for you to be mindful. Also, it reminds you so that if you think, oh, well, this person felt this way, you can go back and flip and make sure you're right. Because I can't tell you how many times I've said, oh, well, I wonder why the stakeholder said that. And I flip back and I'm like, you know, it's because they didn't say that, right? So it's important for us to keep a journal of some kind and be mindful of who our stakeholders are. It sounds kind of hokey, but it works. It works really well. Second, manage and plan time with them. Now, this is probably one of the hardest ones on the list to do, right? Uh, it's easy to spend time with the loudest and most important people who are just always waving a flag. But if you take a moment to see that you're giving a fair amount of time to the other stakeholders, it's interesting to see the things you come up with. Sometimes the lowest voice is the one who has the greatest need, right? So 
sometimes these people have really good insights about other things too, and you're losing out, you're missing out on their ideas. So I think it's important for you to give those balance. Dave, great advice. Uh, number three says, try and get motivations and needs early. So try to get to the motivations and needs early. I agree. I, I think that sometimes, you know, we, we walk into this forgetting that every stakeholder has their own agenda, context, narrative, et cetera, right? It's just, if you try to capture all this and get a view, especially in a large organization, it's going to be hard for you to put piece and part it all together, especially if there's contradicting needs or if there's there, there's some confusion or if there's duplicity of people working on things or needing things, it's going to be hard for you to determine how that's going to affect the actual final outcome of the product that you're working on, right? So it, there comes a time where we need to start asking some of the more difficult, uh, powerful, open-ended questions like, um, what does done look like to you or how should we measure success, right? And when you start asking those kind of questions, it really generates needful conversation that uh, shows that you're aware and shows that you're moving in a pattern that makes sense. Coming at number four is get out of the meeting construct. Oh my goodness, thank you, thank you, thank you. One of the biggest negative patterns of the COVID-19 world is that the only interactions you have with some people are in the context of a meeting. True, true, true. Uh, this doesn't leave room for a quick chat, a nice open-ended conversation, a question over coffee, right? So I think we need to recreate those things. And, and I talked about this with one of the organizations that I was training uh, last week. So I was training a private company last week and uh, we were talking about some of the things that they were facing, some of their trials, and they have people all over the world. And one of the things that they were facing was that uh, they called it meeting fatigue. They said, we spend so much time in meetings that we hate agile. <laughs> and I was like, well, that makes sense, right? And somebody added it up, and I'll never forget this comment. Uh, so in an in a earlier class, a guy said, yeah, I figured it out. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, if I attend my sprint planning meeting and I attend my retrospective, I said, yeah, he says, and then I attend 17 daily standups each day, I won't have to go to, I won't have to do any work. I'll just be going to meetings all day. And, you know, he said it half-heartedly, but I got where he was going with it. It's just sometimes when you have that much work to do, uh, you know, you need to start leveraging some tools. Tools like Slack can help you with that. Uh, you know, you just want to take some of the pressure off of always thinking you have to have a meeting to solve a problem. And then finally, number five is remember stakeholders are people too. And this one, sorry, I'm a little emotional about this one. This one's good. You know, it's just, Oftentimes, we're so busy dealing with balancing the needs of the consumers, worried that we're dropping a ball on something or that we're not keeping up with what's happening. That's a reality for stakeholders. Stakeholders oftentimes have so many things going on that they, they're worried themselves about their jobs and about what's happening and about the future of the product or the service that they're building. And sometimes we don't take those things into consideration. But sometimes the ones with the most insight and it can be a most value of you to your sprint are the ones that are most popular with other people as well. So you have to budget for their time. You know, you're just a slice in a giant overcommitted pie. One of the things that I always mention in my classes is I say, the best stakeholders are the ones that I always find are allocated, you know, 28% to this project, 56% to this project, 71% to this project, 38% to this project, and 56% to this project. Because someone added that together and it equals 100% of their time, which we all know is not true. But you know, this creates that death by meeting syndrome. And I think that if you figure out a way to invest a little more time up front in ideation and initiation, uh, in coming up with that MVP, it's going to make it easier for you to spend time with the stakeholder at that point, And it's going to make that time more valuable in the future. So I think that you need to consider that when you're trying to piece all this together, right? And I think the overarching message that Dave sends here, which I think is a beautiful message, is that the piece to manage a stakeholder puzzle positively, the one, the one that has the biggest impact, is to make sure your interactions are fun and enjoyable. You know, even though that seems obvious, you know, I've sat through so many meetings where you know, I'd like to review backlog item number 978614, adjust the parameters as an end user. I'd like to adjust the parameters so I can have better end user satisfaction. It drives me crazy, right? So, you know, I, I'm not saying that it requires a lot of effort and you need to plan a large event, but, you know, the way stakeholders perceive a project is how they interact with its people. So I think that if you give them a positive interaction and you're lively and you're upbeat and you're doing the things you need to do, that you can have a huge impact. So Dave, I got to say it, you knocked this one out of the park, my friend. 
This is a great article on scrum.org. If you haven't read it, go ahead and go over there, head over there, take a look at it. It's a good thing. If you have something that you'd like for us to review, an article, something that's going on, don't hesitate. Send it over to learnmoreatagiledad.com where we'd love to uh, cover it, figure out what's going on, give our, give our take on it, give our opinion, and uplift the people who are at this article. So outstanding job. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again next time. Until then, stay healthy, stay well, and stay agile, my friends. Do take care.